morning, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, uh, today we have Dr. Anna Lorenko. Um, Dr. Lorenko uh, received her medical degree from University of Massachusetts um, and then continued with her radiology um, residency at Brown University, where she is currently an associate program director and program director, uh, excuse me, program director for the radiology residency as well. Dr. Um, Lorenko completed her fellowship uh, in women's imaging in Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, and she is now at Brown once again. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Lorenko, for your uh, time and for um, giving us this lecture today. Wonderful. Well, uh, thank you for having me. It's actually pretty exciting. This is my first um, experience in lecturing with Health for the World, and I'm very excited to be here. So thank you for the invitation. Um, good morning, my time, perhaps good afternoon or good evening, um, your time, because there are people from all over. So today I will start um, talking about BIRADS. We're going to talk about some interactive um, cases and go through the BIRADS lexicon for breast ultrasound in particular. And I'll try to make it a little bit interactive. So I have no um, financial disclosures that are relevant to this talk. My objectives are first to apply the BIRADS descriptors and secondly to describe how imaging can predict pathology at times. And to do this, we'll use some real life cases and hopefully point out some potential pitfalls and strategies for avoiding them as we go. So here's our first case. This was a woman who was um, 68 years old. She was sent to us from an outside facility for consultation um, because she had had a breast cyst and wanted another opinion. So, these were the images that um, we saw on her ultrasound at that time. So we've got an anechoic um, cyst with a nice thin wall measuring 1.6 centimeters. And so this is a simple cyst, which is a BIRADS2, right? Our orientation here is parallel to the chest wall. We know that um, cysts can happen in any age group. Um, they certainly are common in the premenopausal years. They're very common around menopause, the so-called perimenopausal years. And in the postmenopausal setting, they're significantly more common if a woman is on hormone replacement therapy. But if you look at the Akron 666 trial, that looked at screening um, ultrasound, postmenopausal women had cysts nearly 40% of the time. So again, not an uncommon uh, finding in a postmenopausal woman, though I will caution you to make sure that you're rigorous in your assessment of the lesion and make sure it's actually a cyst and not something more ominous. Okay, so the same patient comes back to us one year later so now she's 69 years old and she comes for a diagnostic mammogram for a history of cyst, which is a pretty you know, soft indication for a diagnostic mammogram. But nonetheless, we see her and these are her mammogram views. So we see that she's got this mass in the upper central breast. And we also see that she's got some new calcifications um, also in the upper central breast. So this time we take her on to ultrasound and this is what we see. So we're gonna use this mass to go through the BIRADS descriptors and remind ourselves of what are the things that we should assess. So the first thing we should assess is shape. And our options for ultrasound descriptors for shape, according to the BIRADS manual, are oval, round, or irregular. So what do people think the shape of this lesion might be? I was inclined to think it was a little bit rounded. 
you know, you could put a circle over it pretty well. So next we should assess the margins. So here's another view of that same mass. And again, um, I'm a big fan of multiple choice. So I'm giving you the options for BIRADS to describe margins of a mass. So first to decide, is it circumscribed or not circumscribed? And so if it's not circumscribed, then you have these options here. You can describe the margins as indistinct, <clears throat> sometimes difficult to see as angular, microlobulated, or spiculated. And so in looking at this mass, <clears throat> I thought probably there were some microlobulated margins that you can see here. These just small lobulations along the border of that mass with the adjacent tissue. Next is the orientation. So this one's nice and easy. It's either um, one of two things, either parallel to the chest wall or not parallel to the chest wall. And so we think here, this is probably pretty parallel still to the chest wall. And next is the echo pattern, right? So how does it compare to the adjacent tissue? Is it anechoic? Is it hyperechoic? Is it complex, solid, and cystic? We'll talk more about this later in the talk. Hypoechoic or isoechoic. And so for this mass, I think everybody probably agrees that it's hypoechoic relative to the adjacent tissue. And the next is posterior features. So there can be no change in posterior features. We can see, um, Enhancement, so through transmission of sound, we can see shadowing, and sometimes we'll see a combined pattern. So in this case, there's really not much change in the echo pattern um, posteriorly here, so no posterior features. And then the next thing is calcification. So we don't frequently see calcifications on ultrasound, but when we do, it's important to pay attention to them. So we need to figure out, are the calcifications in the mass, outside the mass or perhaps intraductal. And so in this case, we do see a calcification within the mass, which is relevant. So this went on to biopsy and we've described it as round with microlobulated margins, hypoechoic, no posterior features and an associated calcification in the mass. So those are all suspicious features. And at biopsy, this turned out to be an invasive ductal carcinoma. It was grade three, and it was um, estrogen and progesterone receptor negative, but HER2 enriched. And so I'm just gonna take a moment to talk about the HER2 enriched cancers. Um, I find, you know, cancer biology pretty fascinating. You know, one breast cancer is not the same as the other breast cancer. And so there are times when we're able to um, make a pretty good guess what the pathology might be based on the imaging if we know some of these details about tumor biology. So the HER2 enriched cancers are often high grade as this one was. They're often associated with DCIS, which we have, um, remember those adjacent calcifications that we saw on the mammogram. Um, and they are more likely to be um, multifocal. So the calcifications that we saw on the mammogram, those underwent stereotactic biopsy and those were high grade DCIS that was estrogen receptor negative. So indeed this case of a HER2 enriched invasive carcinoma did have associated DCIS. The other thing that I think is important to think about when you're um, dealing with a HER2 enriched cancer is that you know that they're statistically more likely to be multifocal than the HER2 negative cancers. So I don't know what goes on at all of your institutions, how much breast MRI is done in the preoperative setting or if it's available, but certainly um, for me, if I'm at tumor board reviewing a case and I know it's a HER2 enriched cancer, that is often um, a reason for me to suggest considering a preoperative breast MRI because I know that the likelihood of multifocal disease is higher with this particular tumor biology. So here's our next case. We have a 43 year old with um, dense breasts who presents for a screening ultrasound. 
And so um, in Rhode Island, which is where I work, we have density notification um, laws in effect. They've been in effect since 2014. So we do quite a bit of screening ultrasound because women are obligated to get a notification in their mammogram result letter that says their breasts are dense or their breasts are not dense. And so many times they do present for screening ultrasound as an adjunct test. So the first thing for screening ultrasound is we need to think about um, what's the tissue composition and we should include this in our reports um, according to the BIRADS Atlas. And so you may have a tissue composition that's <clears throat> homogeneous, echo texture that is mostly fat. You may have a homogeneous background echo texture that's mostly fibroglandular, or you may have a heterogeneous um, background echo texture. Now, if the patient's getting a high-risk screening ultrasound, or rather a screening ultrasound for dense breasts, you're probably not going to see too much of this first category here, fatty tissue. So this was a patient who presented for her screening ultrasound. She'd had a prior negative mammogram within the last few months, and I was actually on my way to tumor board, and the ultrasound technologist said, hey, I have a screening ultrasound. Do you mind just taking a quick look at it? And so I looked and I said, okay, well, you know, over here looks like a cyst on the right and a cyst on the left. And I'm starting to get into this mindset of, okay, she's got bilateral scattered cysts. This is likely going to be a benign BIRADS2 case. And then I paused at this <clears throat> mass here and looked at the um, internal echoes and some of the margins that I thought were a little bit indistinct and some of the adjacent vascularity. And I said, oh, I need to make a stop and I need to check this particular mass and scan it um, before heading off to tumor board. And so indeed, when I went in the room and I scanned it, this really didn't look like all the adjacent um, innocent benign cysts. And so we recommended this for biopsy. So I have some interactive questions built in here. So maybe we'll use the um, chat feature um, to get some of you to participate and uh, hopefully stay awake during the talk. <laughs> So um, if you're going to give some BIRADS descriptors for the mass margins for this case, what might you say? Okay, we have some microlobulated, we have some indistinct. I like it. There's participation. At least two people are awake. That's great. <laughs> okay. So remember, I'm giving you a little um, <clears throat> multiple choice help even, right? So we have first to decide if it's circumscribed or not. And then if it's not circumscribed, you have the options shown here. And I think, you know, indistinct or microlobulated would be perfectly reasonable descriptors for the mass margins here. Now, this one's kind of, uh, you know, I gave it away because I said we recommended it for a biopsy. So the BIRADS assessment, um, you know, we gave this a BIRADS four, again, based on the fact that we thought there were um, internal echoes that it could be solid and that the margins were indistinct or microlobulated. So at biopsy, this turns out to be another um, invasive ductal carcinoma. This one was grade three, estrogen receptor negative, progesterone receptor negative, and HER2 negative. And so this was a great find. This is one of those cases where screening ultrasound picked up a small but um, aggressive and clinically relevant cancer um, well before mammogram would have. So in this case, the pathologist reported that the um, KI-67 um, was greater than 50%. And so KI-67 is a measure of cell proliferation. And so when it's high, which is greater than 15 to 20%, it's associated with higher grade um, cancers, which um, overall will have unfortunately a poor prognosis. The silver lining, if you will, is that um, cancers with a high KI-67 um, index are going to respond pretty well to chemotherapy, again, the way most high-grade cancers um, often do. So next case is a 63-year-old with a palpable tubular area and pain in her left breast a few days after she had undergone a stereotactic biopsy at our breast center. 
So she comes in, we're always quick to evaluate patients if they have any complaints post-procedure. And we look um, with ultrasound. And so this is what we see. In transverse, you see this rounded area and in SAG it elongates seen here, not much internal vascularity. And let's have folks answer this one, um, or at least at least think about it and answer it in your head if you're not gonna answer it in the chat. So what is the most likely diagnosis? So A, post-procedure hematoma, B, a dilated duct, C, DCIS, or D, Mondor's disease. And Daniel, if you wanna tell us if we have some answers, that would be great. We are getting Ds. Lots uh, of Ds. Yeah, many Ds. Okay, perfect. So that's exactly right. So this is Mondor's disease. It's a BIRADS2 benign entity, and it's a superficial thrombophlebitis. Um, and, you know, initially it will be red and um, often pretty tender and will be cord like, just like this patient had described, and just like we see here on ultrasound that it looks um, elongated here. Um, and then eventually it becomes painless. Um, they're most common in the upper outer or, um, breast or the periareolar region. And um, they're self-limited. Um, you know, sometimes we do ask about, um, you know, what could have caused this in this particular patient because it's not very common. So, you know, post biopsy setting for sure, post operative setting at times. It's pretty rarely associated with cancers. Um, you, you know, it would sort of make sense, you know, cancers being one of the conditions that can make you hypercoagulable, but the association um, is actually pretty rare uh, in practice. And it does sometimes make you wonder about other causes of hypercoagulability. So all things that are reasonable to think about. Okay, here's our next case. So this is a younger patient who presented with a palpable right breast mass at age 35. And so here are um, her images. This is an MLO view with the BB delineating the palpable finding. And these are ultrasound images of the palpable area in the upper central right breast. So you can see she's got extremely dense breast tissue, which is not uncommon at age 35. In the area of the palpable abnormality, there is a mass seen on mammogram even amidst the dense tissue. And here it is on ultrasound. So what is the BIRAS assessment that you would give this case? We are getting some Bs, some Cs, and some Ds as well. Okay, this is great. This is actually one of the um, super useful features of having audience response is that we can talk about, um, you know, why someone would pick any of those uh, answers. So, <clears throat> We biopsied this and it came back as an invasive ductal cancer, um, triple negative. So high grade bad actor. And so what can we you know, glean from, from a case like this? So we know that the triple negative um, cancers are more common in premenopausal women and particularly in African-American women. And it is one of the reasons that um, some organizations recommend that African-American women should actually be screened at a younger age. <clears throat> triple negative cancers comprise 15% of all breast cancers. And as we know, they're aggressive, they have a poor survival. Um, and when they recur, they usually rec recur in the first um, three years. And when there are METs, unfortunately, it's usually visceral metastases. And this is in contrast to the estrogen receptor positive cancers that can recur you know, sometimes decades later. And when they have METs, they're usually isolated to bone. And women with metastatic disease from breast cancer, if they have isolated bone metastases can actually survive for quite a number of years. Unfortunately, the um, visceral metastases are not associated with that good um, 
a survival uh, prognosis. So I wanna go back and look at the slide with just the images here, right? So what are my you know, teaching points and the potential pitfalls? So number one, the patient's young, right? And so um, you know, I often will tell the residents when I'm teaching, um, assume nothing good happens in a postmenopausal breast, right? Because as with most any cancer, um, the likelihood of a cancer increases oh, yeah. age. Yes. Um, Protein screening. All right. Thank you. I think somebody might need to mute. <laughs> um, but it's important to bear in mind that when younger women get cancer, this is the variety of cancer that they usually get. It's the high grade bad actor cancers that unfortunately can kill people. So what do, what do I look at for this case? I look at number one, it's a palpable finding. And so I caution you to view palpable abnormalities with an increased index of suspicion. Number two, could this be a fibroadenoma, right? For the people who answered BIRADS3, that's gonna be the most likely thing that was probably going through your head. Absolutely, it could be a fibroadenoma. But I think if we look at the margins for this mass, some of them you may wanna say are macrolobulated, but in some areas there may be a little microlobulation, a little bit more indistinct appearance to the margins. And I will tell you that the other thing I ask myself when I'm in the room with a patient and I'm deciding for myself, am I going to say that this is probably benign, follow it in six months, or I'm going to say that this needs a biopsy? I always ask myself, do I want to miss a cancer that's this big? And the answer in this case is going to be undoubtedly no, right? This is you know probably close to three centimeters, huge. So things to think about. We have some more cases coming up that will continue to um, help us understand some of these lesions. So this patient is 46. So again, premenopausal, another palpable mass, left breast. So this has a triangular marker denoting the palpable abnormality. And when I enlarge the image there, so hopefully it's a little easier to see on PowerPoint, you can probably discern that there are some calcifications and a mass, right? And so here's the corresponding ultrasound. Now, what about this mass? I would say that this one looks even more like a fibroadenoma potentially, right? With the coarse calcifications, it's definitely parallel to the chest wall. This too was a grade three invasive carcinoma. This one had associated DCIS, turned out to be hormone receptor positive and HER2 negative. And so the ultrasound features of high grade cancers I think are really important to um, keep in mind. So they have pushing borders. So high grade cancers, they, they cells grow so quickly that they end up with these sort of pushing borders, which is what you're seeing here. As opposed to the low grade estrogen receptor positive cancers that are sort of slowly growing and there's time for the adjacent tissue to form that desmoplastic reaction that often gives you spiculated margins or associated architectural distortion. And that will give you the shadowing on ultrasound that's sort of the textbook breast cancer um, appearance. These are very different. So we've got the pushing borders. Sometimes we will have posterior enhancement increased through transmission of sound because the cells are so similar and so densely packed that sometimes you get increased through transmission of sound, which can certainly throw you off. Sometimes there'll be calcifications in the mass with these high grade cancers. They're often a parallel orientation to the chest wall. Sometimes they can look rounded again, they, cells growing very quickly, giving you that rounded mass shape. And um, it's actually um, been shown in a study out of Korea that I would refer you to. It's a really very interesting paper looking at um, screening ultrasound. So some of the um, masses that were assessed as BIRADS 4A, there was actually an association with those being the high grade cancers with the bad outcomes, which tells you that we can all be fooled and think that these things are more likely gonna be fibroadenomas and then they turn out to be high grade cancers, right? So this study out of Korea looked at screening detected cancers. 
survival rates and the clinical um, pathologic and imaging features associated with recurrence. And so again, they found that it was actually the BIRADS 4As, so the ones that have those tricky benign features that were most associated with uh, poor survival and higher recurrence rates. So just to bear in mind some of the places that you know you could potentially go down the tubes if you don't think about um, high risk, um, sorry, high grade cancers as a possibility. So we'll contrast that high grade cancer to this scenario. So this woman's 73, so postmenopausal, she comes for screening. I didn't include the screening mammogram, but it was an irregular mass with associated architectural distortion. Here it is on ultrasound. This one has read the ultrasound textbook and the MAMO textbook for what a breast cancer looks like, right? Small mass, I told you irregular margins on MAMO associated architectural distortion. Here it is on ultrasound, irregular hypoechoic with some posterior shadowing. This one has read the book. This one is a grade one invasive ductal carcinoma. It's hormone receptor positive. HER2 negative. So this is the classic. So none of us want to miss cancers, right? That's, you know, we show up every day trying to find every single cancer as soon as possible. But it's just worth remembering that, you know, if you miss a cancer like this, a biologically relatively indolent cancer, it's unlikely that you're going to alter the patient's clinical outcome significantly if she's someone who shows up for regular screening. When you miss the prior variety of cancers, the ones I just showed, the high grade, triple negative, that clinical outcome is definitely going to be worse when those are not um, diagnosed at the earliest opportunity. So next case, we have a 25 year old, um, follow up of palpable left breast mass. So here are the ultrasound images. We've got an oval, hypoechoic solid mass, probably a little bit increased through transmission of sound, parallel to the chest wall, pretty circumscribed margins, a little bit of internal vascularity. And so this one indeed was a fibroadenoma, just so nobody thinks that, you know, fibroadenomas have, uh, you know, gone extinct. This one is a fibroadenoma. It looks like a duck. It quacks like a duck. Um, and that's what it was. So, um, 29 year old palpable left breast mass. Again, another young patient. And again, we have a hypoechoic mass. It looks solid, looks like there's not much change in the posterior features. These margins, I think, look pretty lobulated here. Um, this is the type of appearance that I would biopsy rather than follow. Um, even though the patient's very young, and I know that statistically it's still likely to be a fibroadenoma, the appearance is not classically benign enough for me to want to follow it in contrast to the prior case that we just looked at. And again, I'm asking myself, if this is a cancer, do I want to miss a cancer that's this big? No, I do not. And so this one uh, was biopsied. The pathologist uh, reported it as a cellular fibroepithelial lesion with a differential of fibroadenoma or phyloides. And they do that sometimes. They have a tough time um, deciding. And so it went to excision because of the ambiguity in the pathology report and turned out to just be a benign fibroadenoma. The next case is a 70 year old with a palpable right breast mass. And so this one's not an eye test, right? We see a high density oval mass in that subareolar breast. Um, there's impressive internal vascularity here, and I think an anti-parallel orientation. <laughs> well, I answered the question for you, right? So this is not parallel. Um, and this one went to biopsy, certainly. So it was, you know, large, high density, palpable, many, many reasons to biopsy. This came back as a malignant phyloides tumor. So this is a very uncommon histology. It's only 1% of breast neoplasms. We really cannot tell based on the imaging appearance if it's benign or malignant. The times when we should think about phyloides tumors in our differential is when we see a particularly large mass, so greater than three centimeters, and um, or associated cystic change in the mass. Those are things that make you think, huh, I wonder if this is a phyloides, not just a fibroadenoma. 
The vast majority of phyloides tumors are benign, but the surgeons will take a wider margin around a phyloides tumor, trying to get about a centimeter, because even when they're benign, they can locally recur. And so um, that's the reason to take a wider margin at initial excision to hopefully prevent any local recurrence. And so for benign phyloides, the recurrence is between five and 30% for borderline or malignant um, as high as 65%. So look at this companion case. This one's even bigger, right? Six centimeters. It's definitely got some cystic change. It's got some solid components with internal vascularity. This one was biopsy turned out to be a benign phyloides tumor. So again, just to highlight the contrast that, you know, we really can't predict with imaging, which is going to be malignant and which is going to be benign. That's really for pathology um, to diagnose. All right, here's our next case. We have a 73 year old with a new round right breast mass on um, screening TOMO. Uh, that went to ultrasound for further evaluation. So here it is seen in transverse and sagittal. Let's do this question. What is the echo pattern for this mass? Anechoic, hyperechoic, complex cystic and solid, hypoechoic or isoechoic? We are getting many Cs. Outstanding. So that is indeed correct. It's complex solid and cystic, which warrants an ultrasound guided biopsy. And in this case at ultrasound core biopsy, we got a result of papillary carcinoma. So that's also one of the classic pathologies you think about when you see a complex solid and cystic mass. I want to make the point that complex solid and cystic masses are different from complicated cysts. And so we'll have an example uh, coming up that contrasts that, but I would um, just remind everybody to be um, specific and be accurate with your BIRADS descriptors. Sometimes people interchange complex and complicated in their descriptions, and they're really very different. So the descriptor complex, solid, and cystic should lead you down the road of biopsy. Whereas a complicated cyst may be a probably benign finding or a completely benign BIRADS2 finding depending on the scenario. So if you try to aspirate these um, masses, you'll often get bloody fluid from papillary carcinomas. Cytology um, could make the diagnosis, but is going to be less accurate than a core biopsy. And papillary carcinomas are pretty uncommon, uh, representing less than 1% of all breast cancers. They are certainly more common in an older demographic, and they're less likely to involve lymph nodes even when they're invasive. So overall, the prognosis for these cancers is a bit better than your run-of-the-mill. Um, invasive ductal carcinoma. So I promised the contrast. So here is the complicated cyst, right? And so here you can see that there are homogeneous internal echoes. Again, we've got parallel orientation. There's no part of this that is um, discreetly solid in contrast to the prior. There may be adjacent cysts in the neighboring tissue. And so complicated cysts, you know, if you have someone call back from a mammogram for a new or changing mass and you find a complicated cyst as the corresponding abnormality, those are often assessed as probably benign BIRADS3 with the short interval follow-up at six months. On the other hand, if you encounter a complicated cyst in the setting of, say, a screening ultrasound where there are cysts in both breasts and some are simple and some are complicated and some are clustered, that's a benign BIRADS2 finding. So it really does depend on the context, but important to just use the appropriate terminology. Complicated is not interchangeable with complex, solid and cystic. All right, so next lady is 67. She presents for a screening mammogram. And so on this screening mammogram, she's got a small mass in the outer central right breast posteriorly. And this was the corresponding mass at ultrasound. I'll give you a um, couple of minutes just to look at the ultrasound images. And I think we have a 
question coming up. No, maybe not. <laughs> so in this case, um, the recommendation was for biopsy with some, you know, indistinct margins, but I could see a scenario where someone may have said um, six month follow up and thought this was just a complicated, um, uh, rather a, a cluster of cysts with some internal septations here. But whoever saw this was wise enough to recommend a biopsy. And so this came back as a papillary carcinoma in situ. When it went on to excision, they found an invasive ductal carcinoma with papillary features that was hormone receptor positive and um, HER2 negative. So it's a pretty small percentage um, of papillary carcinomas that upgrade to invasive dis disease at surgical excision. Um, this happened to be one of them. But I think one of the reasons that we follow sometimes um, cases like this where there's a mass and we think there's a cluster of cysts or a complicated cyst is because this can be an appearance of DCIS at ultrasound, right? And so what may have also um, motivated the radiologist who saw this case to recommend it for biopsy rather than follow-up is this was a postmenopausal patient with a new finding. And, you know, if you go by the rule of sort of assume nothing is benign in the postmenopausal setting and prove it's benign, you know, a new finding really is better um, pursued with biopsy than follow-up. We'll move to a little bit younger patient, 45-year-old um, who has pathologic nipple discharge and a negative mammogram. So what are some of the things that make discharge pathologic? I'll give you a moment to put some of them in the chat. What should you ask the patient if she's at your breast center and she says, I have nipple discharge? There are certain things you're going to want to ask. We are getting um, many responses. Mm, okay. Some blood, some say symmetrical, greenish color, spontaneous, uh, single duct. Perfect. So we have some good responses there. So the things that makes um, nipple discharge pathologic is unilateral, um, makes you worry spontaneous, clear or bloody discharge, and discharge from a single duct. So whenever I have a patient presenting with nipple discharge, I always ask, is it unilateral or bilateral? Is it spontaneous or only if you squeeze the nipple? What is the color? And does it come out from multiple spots on the nipple or only one spot? And that's the question that patients may have some trouble answering if, um, particularly if you have a woman that's never nursed, she may not pay much attention to that. Usually the women who've nursed know that there are a lot of ducts that open onto the nipple and they'll be able to sort of pinpoint, oh, it's always one spot or actually it's multiple spots, right? So if we got unilateral, spontaneous, <clears throat> clear bloody and single duct, we're worried that it's pathologic nipple discharge. So we did a retrorealer ultrasound. Remember I said the mammogram was negative. And so we see a duct with a little introductal mass there. And we recommend it for biopsy. And this comes back as an introductal papilloma. And so papillomas are, you know, by and large, the most common etiology for pathologic nipple discharge. And if they're symptomatic, you know, as, as in this case, presenting with nipple discharge, most of the time they go to excision because patients don't like that uh, symptom. If they're incidental, so sometimes we'll, you know, get a papilloma as a result of an ultrasound guided biopsy, patient has no symptoms, but it was just a mass seen on ultrasound or on mammogram, or we do a stereotactic biopsy for calcifications and we get papilloma, but there's no associated nipple discharge. So if they're incidental, they're actually um, kind of controversial high-risk um, lesions with a very low upgrade rate to malignancy. And so you could certainly make the argument to just put the patient into routine imaging follow-up or to excise the papilloma because of the um, low upgrade rate to malignancy. 
Um, what we do frequently if we get papilloma as a result is we send them off to um, a surgical consultation where the patient and the surgeon discuss pros and cons of observation, surgery, they consider other things like the patient's risk factors for breast cancer, certainly her risk tolerance, um, and make a decision from there. So this one paper by Han showed an upgrade rate of less than 1% in 383 biopsies of papilloma without atypia. And so that's pretty low, right? If you think about the cost and the morbidity and the potential complications of surgery, you know, less than 1% in a series of 383, I think many people would probably opt for imaging observation. Ahn's paper um, developed a scoring system for the risk of upgrade and found that the risk of upgrade increased if the patient was symptomatic, if the lesion was palpable, if it was over one and a half centimeters, and if it was peripheral. And so again, this is in the very broad category of those high-risk lesions where really it's shared decision-making the um, patient and the provider come up with a plan that seems reasonable. So we don't want to leave the men out of the breast imaging um, lecture. And so this was a 33-year-old gentleman who presented with a palpable left breast mass. And you can see there's a BB marking the palpable area and um, the nipple. And you can see this fat density mass here. Better seen on that enlarged view, I hope. And that's what it looks like on ultrasound a pretty hyper echoic and circumscribed mass surrounded by fat. And so what are some thoughts on what this might be? Someone from the audience, well, two people are um, saying lipoma. Perfect, that's exactly right. So it's a lipoma. So these are super common in men and women. They're just fat cells with a fibrous capsule. On physical exam, they'll be soft and mobile. Um, and you know, if the patient's weight changes, the size of the lipoma often does as well. Um, so there's really nothing that needs to be done for these. If it's growing, they you know may go on to surgical um, excision just for the symptoms and the the fact that it's. Uh, increasing in size, but these are, you know, a benign entity, super common. And on TOMO, sometimes we can see a nice capsule around them as we can see here, um, a fatty mass. So that brings us to take home points for um, this portion of the lecture. I definitely have more cases, but I'll leave a little bit of time for some interaction and questions um, as soon as we round this out. So take home points from this segment. So you want to carefully evaluate the mass shape, the margins, the orientation, echo pattern, posterior features, and calcifications. And so I think one of the reasons that BIRADS is so great as a useful guide in clinical practice is if you're actually meticulous about going through and appropriately describing all the features, it kind of leads you down the correct path of, you know, these are ones that need biopsy and these are ones that don't. So um, very, very helpful in clinical practice. Um, you want to have an increased index of suspicion with palpable masses. So palpable masses to me mean they're either new or growing because all of a sudden the patient notices them or the physician notices them. So be wary of palpable masses. And keep in mind the contrast of imaging findings for high-grade cancers versus the low-grade cancers, right? The high-grade cancers have the pushing borders. They may have acoustic enhancement. They may be round. They may be parallel to the chest wall. The low-grade cancers are going to have an irregular shape, posterior acoustic shadowing. They're not going to be parallel to the chest wall. And again, just bearing in mind the biology of each of these diseases, um, and you know, trying to catch all of the high-grade cancers in particular as, at the earliest possible opportunity. So uh, that's my email contact. I'm absolutely um, happy to hear from you via email and in person on this um, on this Zoom. I think we'll leave some time for questions, and then again, I have an, another PowerPoint with some additional cases if people prefer that. But I'll leave it to the group to decide.
Dr. Lorenko, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Very comprehensive, excellent cases. Uh, if anyone from the audience have any question, questions, please feel free to type them uh, right now. Um, otherwise, we can maybe, um, we have 50 more minutes, we can maybe go through additional cases. Yeah, I'll pull those up while people are deciding if they have questions. And thank you for the audience as well for participating. Uh, Is there uh, a question? Two questions, yes, uh, from Dr. Agarwal. Um, the question says, how to differentiate infective mastitis from granulomatose mastitis in non-lactating 30-year-old female? Um, I'm sorry, can you give me that one more time? Differentiating mastitis from? The infective type versus the granulomatose type in a non-lactating 30-year-old female. Yeah, those are super challenging. Um, you know, granulomatous mastitis, women generally present with considerable pain, not so much the um, erythema sometimes, but I have found that most of the time, if they fail a course of antibiotics, um, that you just need to biopsy them. You know, if you have a reliable patient that's going to return for follow-up imaging, there's not much harm in a course of antibiotics and just seeing if, you know, the more common infectious mastitis is what's going on. Um, but if it doesn't, if it doesn't clear that it needs a biopsy and granulomatous mastitis can be very morbid. Um, patients have a lot of symptoms, surgery, sometimes they end up, um, you know, having to remove quite a bit of breast tissue. It's almost like an oncology surgery, if not worse. Um, they do try um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories um, sometimes, and I've even seen patients try it on methotrexate sometimes to control their symptoms. So it's really, you know, a difficult diagnosis. They need to be hooked up with a breast surgeon, and um, sometimes the course is pretty prolonged and it can recur, unfortunately. Thank you. We have a couple more questions. Uh, sure. The next one is how to differentiate accessory breast versus fat? Accessory breast tissue versus fat. So maybe like up in the axilla, sometimes people present with, you know, fullness, asymmetric fullness in the axilla. So, um, you know, you can try an axillary tail view on MAMO, you know, fatty tissue is just going to be fat density. Um, if it's, you know, more um, dense glandular tissue, then that gives you a good sense that it's probably accessory breast tissue. Similarly on ultrasound, as you're scanning through, it really depends on the echogenicity of the tissue where the fat's gonna be pretty hypoechoic, but sometimes you'll see, you know, areas of um, more echogenic glandular tissue well up into the axilla. Thank you. Uh, the next one is, do you do complementary ultrasound for most masses seen in mammogram? Yes, if we see a mass on mammogram, it goes on to ultrasound. Okay, and the last question we have, uh, can we be safe to request biopsy for lesions with BIRATS 2 features on mammo? Well, I would say if it's BIRADS 2 features on MAMO, then you should probably leave it alone. Um, you know, BIRADS 2 masses being, you know, multiple circumscribed masses, at least three, both breasts involved, that's a typical BIRADS 2 pattern. And that's the challenge with breasts, that there's so many variations of normal and so many benign things, and we can't possibly biopsy everything. So you do need to be able to be comfortable assessing some things as benign if they meet the criteria that are established. Okay, that was the last question. And then we are getting many thank yous from the audience. Sure. It was a very wonderful lecture. Uh, we still have uh, about 12 minutes. We could go on and see a couple more quick cases. Absolutely. I am pulling them up now. So hopefully you can see the screen again. Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay. So 
some more cases. So this was, was a 41 year old woman with a newly diagnosed left breast cancer. So she had an MRI as part of her preoperative workup. She was young and had dense breast tissue. So all reasons to um, do an MRI preoperatively. And you can see that that's her known cancer. There's some signal um, drop from the biopsy marking clip in the known cancer. You can also see she's got quite a bit of background enhancement as we often see in premenopausal women. This was a um, grade one invasive and uh, in situ cancer that was hormone receptor positive and HER2 negative. In addition, the MRI showed this area in the ipsilateral breast. And so what are some ways people might describe this abnormality? So that's probably gonna be some linear non-mass enhancement. And you can see it's pretty um, distinct from the contralateral breast. So we recommended MRI um, guided biopsy for this abnormality because it's not really an abnormality that will often have a correlate on mammogram or ultrasound. And so certainly MRI guided biopsies are more involved, but many times that's our most accurate way to um, sample this type of abnormal enhancement. So I, I answered this one for you. We went on to MRI guided biopsy. And this turned out to be high grade DCIS with necrosis and microinvasion. And so remember that her prior um, known cancer was in the upper central breast. This is now, you know, at least at the level of the nipple, if not below. So she's got at least multifocal disease, if not multicentric disease, and, um, you know, may no longer be a candidate for breast conservation, depending on. Um, you know, her breast size and the distance between the two cancers. So um, this is a 25 year old man, indeterminate palpable nodule left breast. So without any imaging, what are you gonna suggest as the first imaging for this guy? He's 25 with a palpable. We are getting some mammographies, some Bs, okay. and Cs. Okay, so good. So 25 and older, mammogram is a reasonable first test um, according to the ACR appropriateness criteria. And this is what the mammogram looked like. And so we have a palpable um, on the left marked by the BB, but clearly the right breast is also of interest here, right? So what's the diagnosis for the left breast? Cancer, sebaceous cyst, nodular gynecomastia, dendritic gynecomastia, or diffuse glandular gynecomastia. We are getting mixed responses between C, D, and E. Okay, good. So great opportunity to talk about gynecomastia. So in this case, it's nodular gynecomastia. So it's really, you know, looks like a nodule directly below the nipple. Um, and gynecomastia is a BIRADS 2 diagnosis. It is important to know what gynecomastia looks like on ultrasound um, so that you're not... Um, you know, led down the path of biopsy if you happen to do an ultrasound. Although the classic teaching is that you should be able to diagnose gynecomastia off of mammogram alone. And so this is a pretty good appearance for nodular gynecomastia. What's the diagnosis for the right breast? We are getting Lots of, lots of ease. Okay, that's excellent. That's exactly right. This is diffuse glandular gynecomastia. 
So this is gynecomastia that really looks like a heterogeneously dense female breast, right? This could be my breast, except that probably the pectoralis muscle is way too huge because I don't lift that much, right? But this looks like a female breast, right? So that's the diffuse glandular gynecomastia. The dendritic gynecomastia is that sort of flame-shaped tissue behind the nipple, not as nodular as the nodular gynecomastia, more of that flame-shaped tissue. And again, gynecomastia is benign, right? So the nodular variety um, usually is less than one year of symptoms. If you catch it early enough and you can identify an etiology, which many times, you know, these can be side effects of a very large number of different medications and you can remove the offending agent, sometimes it will regress. The dendritic or flame-shaped um, is usually more than a year of symptoms, usually no longer reversible. And then the diffuse glandular that mimics the heterogeneously dense female breast um, can be associated with elevated uh, estrogen states. And again, generally not gonna be reversible. So if it bothers the gentleman enough, they can see a surgeon and they can get the tissue removed for cosmetic reasons. But most of the time what they wanna hear is it's not cancer and people are generally pretty relieved by that. In older gentlemen, I often ask about any medications they may be on for prostate issues because sometimes the hormone blockade um, of Lupron um, will lead to gynecomastia. Um, you know, ma marijuana use is super common. And I ask about that in all ages now because it's legal in so many places. You know, I used to tailor that conversation to the you know, younger demographic a little bit, but I ask it of everybody now. Um, you know, longstanding liver disease, you know, reviewing the whole list of medications, um, definitely important in these cases and generally re referring them back to consult with their primary care physician. So again, if the mammographic findings are classic for gynecomastia, you can defer the ultrasound. The negative predictive value of mammography is super high, reported as high as 100%. So a 57 year old woman coming with left breast pain and no priors. So this is the initial mammogram. We can see the triangular marker denoting the palpable finding. And you can see even from the initial views without the enlargement that there are lots of calcification, some of them are linear branching. There's probably a high density mass in the middle of all of that. So what might we do next? And remember she had a palpable. we are getting mixed responses between D, B, and A. Okay, so all of those are necessary. So we did the ultrasound next because of the palpable finding and we saw this irregular mass with associated calcifications and we saw a mass even extending to the subareolar breast. So let me ask this, what do you guess could be the histology of this case that's got a mass with calcifications? What do we think the receptor status and the HER2 status might be? How about the HER2 status in particular? HER2 positive or HER2 negative? <laughs> We got one positive and one negative. There you go. Could be anything. <laughs> That's why we biopsy it. All right, there's our subareolar mass. There's the dominant mass with calcifications. So this turned out to be a grade three in situ and invasive cancer, hormone receptor negative and HER2 positive. If you remember the last um, PowerPoint, we showed that mass with calcifications. So the HER2 positive cases are the ones that you, you, you would think HER2 positive when you see mass and calcifications, right? So you would think HER2 enriched, which this one was. Are we always right with our prediction? We're not, but it's okay. So these are the high grade tumors. We talked about this a little bit in the last one. They have a high KI67 uh, expression, often associated with calcs, DCIS, often multifocal or multicentric. So remember, if you're considering MRI, this is one of the things that if it's a HER2 enriched cancer, 
would argue for increased utility of MRI. They do respond to the HER2 targeted therapies. And um, when these metastasize, unfortunately, it's often visceral mets to brain and liver, not isolated bone disease. So this brings us to the end here. We are good with that. And I think we're pretty close to 10 o'clock, two minutes to spare for a couple of last questions. And we do have them. We have two questions okay. that I think would be interesting to answer. Um, sure. The first one is, what is the next step with pathological nipple discharge if you don't see anything on mammography or ultrasound? Fabulous question. And so um, I should have um, included that in the discussion. So thank you for the question. So the first thing I do is if I decide that, you know, the patient's history is such that it's definitely pathologic nipple discharge and you have a negative uh, mammogram and a negative ultrasound is I tell the patient, this is a symptom that is often related to a benign papilloma, but can be a manifestation of breast cancer. And so what you need to do next is you need to see a breast surgeon. Often the surgeons will obviously do a physical exam. They'll check the discharge for blood and they will very often order the next imaging test, which these days is really a breast MRI, not a um, ductogram or a galactogram. Um, but I'm certain, you know, availability of MRI is going to vary site to site. Um, and so galactography or ductogram, you know, is something that you can do if you don't have access to MRI. But if you have the luxury of breast MRI, that is definitely the best um, next test. The other thing is that, you know, about once a year, there are patients that come through with pathologic discharge, negative MAMO, negative ultrasound, sometimes even negative MRI. And they see the surgeon and they um, go on to a major duct excision to control the symptoms. And sometimes they have a breast full of cancer that's occult on imaging. And so it's very important that they are connected with the right healthcare provider, which in this case is a breast surgeon. And again, bear in mind that you as the radiologist may be the one who knows the most about how to, ban how to manage pathologic nipple discharge if the patient's referring provider is a general internist or an OBGYN, pretty much anybody besides a breast surgeon. Thank you. And the last question is, is it necessary to count the number of auxiliary lymph nodes during mammogram reporting? Uh, great question. So if it's um, a screening mammogram, absolutely not. If it's someone with a newly diagnosed breast cancer and we're doing an ultrasound of the axilla and there are abnormal nodes, then generally we will report how many abnormal nodes are there because sometimes that will tip the surgeon over about whether they want to do a pre-operative fine needle aspiration or, um, or other lymph node biopsy um, versus just waiting to do the sentinel lymph node surgery at the time of, um, of the breast surgery. All right. Thank you so much. Um, now, last question uh, just came up. What is the normal size of an auxiliary lymph node? That's another great question. So um, the lymph node size overall is not so helpful in the axilla. You can have these really long, thin cortex lymph nodes that are you know, three centimeters, but normal. So it's really all about the morphology of the lymph node and the cortical thickness. So if you have a preserved fatty hilum and a thin um, cortex, so you know, three millimeters or less, those are benign lymph nodes regardless of the overall size. Um, you know, if you have a patient with a newly diagnosed cancer and a cortical thickness greater than three millimeters, then those may be involved with disease um, and could, could warrant biopsy. That's a whole talk in and of itself about the axilla. <laughs> well, with that, I think we can conclude uh, today's lecture. Uh, Dr. Lorenko, thank you. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful lecture. And um, Everyone in the chat is uh, writing, saying that the lecture was awesome. So thank you so much for, for, for volunteering your time here. And for Absolutely. this lecture. It was very comprehensive, very enriching. Excellent.
Excellent. Thank you all for your attention. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks for the opportunity. Likewise. Bye-bye.